Where you scream, don't watch that, watch this. And I'll dive down through this hair reflection. Hi, and welcome to Watch This. I'm CJ Johnson. Thanks for joining me. It is the end of the year. We're full of the Christmas spirit, and I've been joined by an extraordinary panel to discuss the best films of the year. Jim Flanagan, my regular villain, Miriam Kappa <laughs> and Lyndon Barber. Lyndon is one of Australia's preeminent critics. It's his first time on Watch This. He also ran the Sydney Film Festival for a while. We've all come to talk about our films of the year. Thank you very much for joining me, guys. Miriam, what was one of your favourite films of 2017? Well, one of my favourite films, so I went films and TV. Okay. Um, so when I talk about one of my favourite TV shows, which was Master of None. Mm. Um, if you've all seen it. Yep. So for me, the reason that I love this was that it was just so stylistically and creatively different. So it's about the story of an, an Indian man in New York who's trying to um, work himself out professionally and in love. So it's not that the storyline itself is necessarily unique, but the way that the uh, episodes are set up are really, really creative. So Z that's what got Z me going. And Zizanzari. And <laughs> Zizanzari, that's right, yeah. And is it funny? I find it hilarious, um, but I think it's 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 really subtly funny. Every so often there, because he's a comedian himself, so yeah. every so often there are really overt jokes. But I think it's like the the uncomfortable scenarios for me that I find so funny. Um, and so it relates to religion and relates to you know dating and basically everything that covers a thirty early thirty something's life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and I, this it, I, I I watched The Big Sick for the first time mm -hmm. recently, and I, I sort of see some parallels in, in, in those two in terms of the, the kind of the key personnel in, involved in them and I think there's a really healthy move in American television and film at the moment to just kind of diversify their, um, mm. their cultural group a little bit and America is one of the, you know, the great multicultural societies on the planet and there seems, there seems to be a, a non-tokenistic healthy look to, um, I'd say that's to true. emphasize you know, um, content yeah. that isn't just based on white people in Manhattan. I'd say it's true. Way. Sorry, I, I think it's true of gender as well on mm. TV. I mean, people talk about the low number of uh, women directors uh, in Hollywood, which yep. is absolutely true. Yeah, it's absolutely tiny. But yes. at the same time, you look at the number of uh, female directors and the number of female-oriented stories mm. uh, with a female lead character that are on, including a female superhero in Jessica Jones. Yep. Then you know, TV yep. is actually wiping. Um, Hollywood's I I agree arts. and when I and CJ gave us a really tricky remit to put this together our top three of the year CJ mm. you're, an, you're an oppressive man <laughs> and I was moving moving yeah. my lines around and I was kind of, I was really happy when I realized just just through you know looking at what I'd love the most this year that I had a female director in, um, in one of my two films so if we include film and television mm. Um, so yeah, I really, really loved, and I know you didn't like it anywhere near as much as, as I did, but what? Certain Women, <coughs> Kelly Reichardt's film was absolutely one of my favourite films. Oh, interesting. And if we're, talking, if we're talking about films that, that had, the, that moved me and engaged me yeah. and surprised me the most, and I think demonstrated the most formidable <laughs> filmmaking craft, Certain Women is absolutely up really? there for me. I just Did you see was, Certain Women? No, I didn't. Love, but pretty perfect. I, no, but another thing, I mean... I'm, I'm do you know Kelly Reichardt? Yeah, I do. Why? I, do you um, like? I brought her out for the Sydney Film oh, right. Festival for really, her that first would film. Early? Why? Yeah. So what was her first film? It I'm, was when, um, I'm trying to remember the title, she, the, about two guys, one of them is Will Oldham, the Old musician. boy, yeah. Mm. Is it called Old no, Boy? No, it's not called Old Boy. Boy. That's, and that's they go camping in the woods oh, together. No, that's, yes. That's a yeah, film. it's very impressive. Yeah, yeah, um, with Will Oldham it's very, and, it, yeah. and another guy, and they're in their thing. And then she did the one with the dog, Yeah, Wendy and the dog. Which yeah. was, oh, which was, was Michelle Williams. Which was yeah. one of in, Michelle Williams' kind of breakout Beautiful films. Yeah. Yeah. And then she did Meek's Rose. Cut Off. Mm. Yeah. Well, and I just think, I think she's a really surprising, excellent filmmaker. And like Meek's Cut Off, which is this sort of anti-Western and just constantly subverts your expectations of... of anything to do with the Western genre. That's what I loved about this. It's three separate stories. The first one is sort of set up as a hostage situation that just dissipates. And again, you know, there, there are no dramatic fireworks and, and you know, all, all three stories are so surprising in how they're, they're written, I think. And I think the whole cast is, is perfect. I think Kirsten Stewart in the last Kirsten one. Kirsten Stewart, yeah. Just, Michelle mean, Williams is in it again. Michelle Williams Laura is in Dern. it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you didn't like it as much as I did. Well, I, I only loved liked the one of the stories. I, th I the thought two of the one. stories didn't really do okay, anything. Okay, all right. Well, anyway, yeah. so I, I think Kelly Reichardt is, is one of the best 
American filmmakers yeah. at the moment. She's interesting. And she's I a professor. A you know, she's film. an academic who occasionally makes films, and she does it all on her yeah. own terms. She makes her films for so little money that she's got yep. complete creative control, and she's really she, good actors. And apparently, yeah. she spends years on the screenplay before she goes anywhere yeah. near it. Um, a camera. But sorry, you're talking about Master of None. Oh no, really that's a good one. Linda. What was one of your favorite? Linda started the hijack. I blame Linda. Yeah, I hijacked. I'm sorry. What was one of your favorite TV shows or films? I manjacked. The phrase is, yeah. Uh, I like well, it. while we're on the gender thing, it's actually my favourite. It hasn't been a boring year in gender politics. I, I, made, this <laughs> one, let's be I had a whole bunch of uh, favourite films and yeah. TV series, uh, but um, probably at the very top I'd put Tony Erdmann, which is another yeah, female that was on film, oh. Maren Arder from Germany, who I've watched, whose career I've watched with a great deal of interest because I tried to bring her out for mm. um, her first film, The Forest for the Trees, which yeah. didn't get a commercial release in Australia or many other countries, but it was her first film. It was a sort of kind of a graduate film for her and it just knocked my socks off and I thought it was one of the best films yeah, I haven't seen in, it. in the yeah. Sydney Film Festival of that year. And we brought out her right. producer because she wasn't able to come but I thought she was an incredibly talented director. And like um, her, Tony Edmund is her third film and it had something in common with that first film which is it didn't really feel like a German film. Mm. It had this kind of really interesting mixture of humour and very serious kind of undertow. Uh, and that ability to just kind of walk on that kind of fine line between mm. things that are actually hilarious, kind of socially awkward sort of situations, mm. um, at, at the same time as, you know, making some very serious points. Because, I mean, you know, Tony Urban really is a comedy, yes, yeah. but it's also a, quite a serious piece about identity in the corporate era. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know, okay, so quite a... And, 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 it, and, it, and I was going to say, a really, a really moving humanist film about yeah. the relationship mm. between a father and his daughter as well. And the, yeah, I loved it And the well. final, it's not quite the final scene, but it's the near and perhaps kind of semi-penultimate scene. Have you seen uh, it, Miriam? I haven't, about to spoil I'm it. missing out. Part, yeah, it's not given away. Okay, so it's not really scene. a spoiler type yeah. of well, movie. <laughs> we'll just yeah. say the the office party scene, yeah. which is in Tony, mm. um, which is in the uh, Sandra Huller's yeah. character's apartment. Sandra yeah. Huller was the lead actress, an amazing yeah. German actor, one of the best working mm. in the world today, I think. Um, uh, it's just one of, the, it is the best scene of any film that I saw in Wow, Arkansas. really? It's wow. yeah. an incredible cool. scene. That is. And yeah. I, I, I note with extreme interest that an American remake is already apparently in, in the early stages. Of Which I can't imagine. Jack Nicholson. Well, apparently you know, is, being, is yeah. being talked about. Jack Nicholson is in it, supposedly. Um, it'll be his first time on the screen in like seven years yeah. or something. Mm. Yeah, he's, oh, well, he's definitely in his deep 70s. And, but the driving force behind the remake is mm. Kristen Wiig. She wants really? to play, yeah, okay. she's, she's playing the daughter. And well, so it's her project. She bought the rights that and sounds, she's producing it. That sounds good to me because I love her and mm, I, yeah. I, I, she's just been in a, just had a bunch of really yeah. frustratingly nothing roles. It's an Oscar play. Like if, if you're ever going to get an Oscar good. as want, Kristen Wiig, you've yeah. got to get it for, right. you know, the remake of Tony Erdman. Yeah, yeah. Because the film, all right, go Chris. even though we, we picture the guy, it's mm. all about her. She is the yeah. protagonist, you know. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. about the woman. Yeah, yeah. it's not Tony yeah, at all. Yeah, it's not yeah. about Tony no, no. Erdman at all. It's a deceptive title. All right, CJ, what about you? Well, just on best scene, since you mentioned scene, I, I have to say the best scene of the year, I don't know if any of you have seen The Square, Ruben no, Rossman's new film. I really oh, want to see it. for it, yeah. In Force majeure director. Yeah, Force yeah. majeure director, yeah. which was my favourite film a couple of years ago. Yeah. In the Square, it's a good film. It's a very good film. It's, it's easily one of the, you know, one of the best films of the year. But... It, whether or not it's like the best film of the year, it's got the best scene because late in the piece, a performance artist played by Terry Notary, mm. who mainly does ape work. Like he basically <laughs> was like the big ape That's in the, the new King Kong movie. Right. Like he's like an Andy Serkis. He's, a, he's an ape specialist. He's an ape specialist. He's mm -hmm. like Andy Serkis. And he's got this crazy body. He doesn't look like a, a gym body. It's more just like unbelievably strong yep. and weird. Yeah. He's Simeon. And, yeah, he's Simeon, he is Simeon. <laughs> and he's a stuntman, like he's a stuntman. Yeah. And not only that, he's like in his deep 40s. So he's like this very, very powerful Simeon middle-aged guy. Yeah. But what does he do? So <laughs> what he does in this scene is, he plays a performance artist who disrupts a formal dinner party 
by pretending to be an ape. Mm. And over the course of at least 15 minutes, you watch these people in bow ties and formal attire getting increasingly perturbed <laughs> by a naked simian dude in coming up to I've them seen stills and of that, freaking okay. them out. Yeah. And it is amazing. <laughs> and it just, all you want to do is you want to run from the cinema, you know, because you start to feel as uncomfortable as these people. So would that be one of your films or television series of the year or you just it's next year it's not it's not it's not really coming out, it's not, it's not coming out in Australia until, until, until March which is ludicrous but it's been uh, it's been across um, the rest of the world yeah. I don't know why they've delayed it uh, no that would did you to, did you have the Florida project on your your the, list the I know that you project liked it is a very lot. very fine film yeah, yeah I yeah. agree yeah yeah you've seen the Florida yeah, project yeah, yeah yeah it's got well, a lot of compassion yeah it does and I think I don't know I think I think Sh Tangerine was on my list last yeah. year, and I think Sean Baker's a really, really special filmmaker, and I think this is a much, much better film than Tangerine. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it's a much more ambitious, complicated, very much a film for our times. I love the cinematography by Alexis Zabi, I yeah, think. Yeah, the who, cinematography's amazing. Yeah, who did all of the, the cinematography for Carlos... Ray Gaddis's films, the sort of so, the kind of slow cinema mixing guy, which isn't really my idea of a good time, but his films just look magical. And well, the thing about the Florida I, Project is you're watching a bunch of kids, and and the lead actress is he found her on Instagram. Mm. She's never acted before. The yeah. kids are all six, but he still frames the film formally. Yeah. So you're not just he hasn't just told his cinematographer to you know like film what the kids are doing. They're yeah. cute. It's not that at yeah. all. They're acting within the frame. Yeah. It's highly composed. Absolutely. With six-year-olds, yeah. which is incredible. And they're all non-actors, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Except, yeah. except Willem Dafoe. Yeah. Except Willem Dafoe. Dafoe. Who's really, the best thing he's done in freaking decades, well, I think. Well, Willem his Dafoe, genius in that great. is he is acting with all these these six-year-olds yeah. and he's keeping them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, he's, he's sort of staying a, with them. He's a sort of emotional anchor of the film as well. Yeah. I don't know, I think Sean Baker's films are very much in sync with a lot of the innovations in kind of modern contemporary cinema at the moment and you know Tangerine he made on his phone and this is a really technically innovative but sort of simultaneously also very classically structured yeah. film. I just he shot it on 35 millimeter. So film. It's, exactly. It's him, yeah. it's you know He's like this indie darling who famously yeah. shot his last film on a phone. It's him doing the opposite. Exactly, making this yeah. big classical cinematic um, film, but still structured in a really innovative modern way. And he yeah. casts one of his lead roles, one of the young, uh, I think, teen performer from um, Instagram. He loved her yeah. Instagram yeah. feed and thought it was very funny and yeah. very, yeah. Uh, you know, loved the the GIFs and the videos that she put on there and thought she was inventive. And her yeah. performance and it, is yeah. exceptional. He has a great ear for music as well and the soundtrack's got a similar to Tangerine, a mixture of a lot of really, really modern underground mm. American music and, mm. and non-modern stuff. I, I think my second favourite film of the year is one that I, I, I gather Lyndon has a slight disagreement with me and that's why I want to bring it up. Call Me By Your Name, mm. which is coming out in Australia, I think the day after Christmas. I think it's incredible, but you No, I don't so think it's incredible, and I love this filmmaker. Luca Guadagnino. Yeah. Uh, Luca Guadagnino. Oh. <laughs> Jesus, I wish I had a name like that. Uh, when Obviously he came Italian. on Holy Land, he was, one of, he was one of my most difficult interviews. Really? Oh, yeah. In what, in what way? He was... He was just... He's... He's... <laughs> he's frantic. He, right. you know, he's, okay. you know, normally when you're sitting across from someone in a, in a radio studio, mm. they're sort of with you and engaged and quite calm. And he was the opposite Ooh, of that. Yeah. But tell us okay. why it's great. Okay, this is the thing about "Call Me by Your Name" that I think is great. It stays with you. It is a love story, which, <laughs> which Excellent. you don't normally get. Just old-fashioned yeah. love stories. Yeah. Like there's no real conflict. There's no real, you know. Tension or drama because is, it is it is not Brokeback Mountain. Brokeback yeah. Mountain is about two people who are struggling with the fact that they feel attraction to each yep. other. One of them more than the other. Yeah. Call me by a name is not that at all. These are two cool guys who see each other. They're attracted to each other yep. and they fall in love. And that's it. There's no. It's not about bigotry. It's not about prejudice. It's not about actually. It's not about being gay. Yep. Mm. It is simply a beautiful love story in Italy in 1983. Mm. And what what stayed with me was the romance of it. Like I just kept thinking about like ah. Oh, that was so nice and those two, and also they're smart people. Everyone in the film is smart. Mm. And the way that they talk to each other is with, with 
intellectual and academic rigor, and it reminds you just how dumb so much dialogue oh, is. God, yeah. Yeah. Because this is intelligent, smart people mm. enjoying being intelligent among each other. So I haven't seen it. You are bored, I take it. Well, I'm not, no, not I, bored. I, um, I, okay. I just felt it was under... under the, the, Look, he's a great director, he's a beautiful director, yeah. and um, a lot of the acting is absolutely superb. And yeah. it creates a fantastic summary atmosphere yeah. that made me think quite a lot of uh, that beautiful um, Jacques Rivette film, La Belle Noiseuse, which mm -hmm. I think is a much superior yeah. film. But, uh, um, um, no, you already said it, really. Yeah, there's no, di there's no, <laughs> okay. there's no conflict. There's, yeah. no, there's no surprises in the script. It's a James Ivory script, Ooh, for God's sake. Is it really? really? Yeah, he's yeah. 90. What? It's a really James Ivory's still writing films? Yeah, if he gets the Oscar, he'll be 90 when he gets oh, up and good. gets it. It's yeah. not a good script, I'm okay. sorry. It is not is it, but a it's not like script. a merchant it Ivory is, film. Uh, and the thing is, you say it's not a gay story. I reckon if you, you actually made that a heterosexual story, it would... It, People, a lot of people who are raving about it, I yeah. suspect, will be going, oh, it's so old-fashioned. It's so yeah. kind of nothing really happens. Mm. Yeah, that it's a love story. We've seen that a million times. Now, okay, if you change mm. that into a gay story, it can be different because the thing that makes so many gay stories really kind of powerful dramatically is that they're about, you know, forbidden love. But the whole point that Luca Guadagnino is making in this film is that in this family, the parents um, are, are very kind of, um, you know, give the blessing to this yeah. relationship. Nobody's mentioned the age difference yet, and I don't know how you can talk about this film as if the age difference <laughs> doesn't count. Uh, I was just having a chat on Facebook with a Texan film critic who said, obviously you agree. Is that Carrie Darling? Carrie Darling, yeah, who, yeah. Who, who said, yeah, he said to him, the younger character, he said, yeah, the boy looks 13. To me, he doesn't look 13, but I thought he, this is a, a, a wow. there's a massive, and, you know, I've seen American critics talking about, oh, there's no real age difference. There's one 17, the other's 24. 20, right. oh, They've read the press kit because that is yeah. what the filmmaker wants you to believe. But yeah. they don't refer to it in the film. Ever. And Army yeah. Hammer, the older of the two characters, look, yeah. is, you know, Army Hammer's in his mid-30s. So you've got a, maybe a boy who could be 16, it's hard to say, yeah. having a relationship with an older guy. Sorry, um... Should we actually discuss this a bit more, kind of a bit less glibly? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, but I'm yes. not saying it's automatically, yeah, I'm not yeah, saying yeah, yeah. moral position is automatically wrong, yeah. and I think that's actually a really interesting subject, yeah. yes, but well, it doesn't really explore that well, subject. I, I, I disagree entirely because I think, I think the parents, throughout the course of the movie, in the background, just mm. very subtly in the background, observe the relationship, mm. and by the end of the film, they come to the conclusion that what their son is doing with this older man is okay. Mm. And that is the journey that we also go on. So yes, when I say it's not mm. a gay story or whatever, but it totally is. Like the yep. movie is about tolerance. Mm. Yep. And it's actually about the parents over the course of the film accepting not only that their son is gay, but accepting that his first major love affair is going to be with a guy who's at least 10 years older than mm. him. And they accept that. Mm. And it, it, that, that is what the film is about. And our response to it is about our own tolerance. You know? Okay. So if, if you have a problem with the fact that he's 16, then you have a problem with the fact that he's 16. But in the film, his parents do not have a problem with it no, because they appreciate yeah. him and the other man. I oh, know that's clear, and to me mm. that, that's kind of dramatically quite boring. Yeah. But anyway, we have a different disagreement. I didn't think I'm not going to win you over, and I don't particularly yeah, yeah. want to, because mm. you've obviously, I mean, I seem to be in the minority, because mm. this, what, what I found strange was like, you know, go on, you go on to Rotten Tomatoes, and you see this film is being greeted as a masterpiece, a 99% fresh mm. yeah. Yeah. Rotten Tomatoes yeah. score, and I'm thinking, there's got to be a backlash to this yeah. film coming, because it's whenever, and I suspect that, I mean, it may not, affect CJ's view of the film, uh, but uh, I suspect, yeah, major controversy coming, uh, that, you know, what's going on in America at the moment? Trump, a, a, an openly racist, reactionary regime, uh, you know, reactionary in all kind of ways. Yeah. Um, Neo-fascistic. Yeah. Um, he'd like to be more fascistic than he is. I mean, it could be even worse, but <laughs> it's a really kind of worrying regime. That has affected the critical environment. So well, I think that you can't really, you can never take away 
the kind of the personal politics of any film, but I think to American critics that's become paramount above I, all else. Hence Moonlighting, mm. which was, I thought, uh, Moonlight, which I think was a, a promising film, in an interesting film, but was treated by a lot of the American critical fraternity, inclu and including Oscar voters, as this grand masterpiece. Well, so I, I think the film could live up to that. I agree, and I think we certainly saw the politics of that. And, I, and, I, and for the right reasons, mm. I understand why that has become yeah, a yeah, powerful cultural force, but I think we saw that playing out in the Oscars mm. this year. And, I, and, and CJ and I talked about this when we, when we did the Oscars at the beginning of the year. I thought the, the, the battle lines were drawn unnecessarily, mm. I think, between La La Land and, and Moonlight. Mm. And um, unfortunately so, because I think, to me, they're two really mm. good well, films, and I, mm. I enjoyed Moonlight. But I, I, I see those... I see that narrative very conspicuous in American cultural mm. history and and filmmaking and the music industry as, as well. It's perfectly understandable. Absolutely, yeah. But yeah. it's good for us to be, we're on the other side of the world, yes. with a little bit more distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we, we can, can see a little bit more clearly. See a little bit more. Well, if you're, yeah. looking, so at, think, yeah. if you're looking at the politics of cinema this year, obviously, you know, with Weinstein Gate, mm. You're, what you're really talking about is gender discrimination. So mm. I, I don't think maybe that will mean that Call Me By Your Name will not be the film that goes all the way to the Oscars, for example, to Best Picture, because it is a story about white men. It might be a gay film, but it's a story about white men. And the, the political discussion mm. this year is not about white men. It's about women. It's about gender. Mm. We'll so, see. Yeah, so yeah, what's, the female, yeah, what's the female? What's the female led project you think that would be in the running? <laughs> well, you know, people were people were speculating that Wonder Woman would go all the way, but I don't think. It's I don't think that's yeah. anywhere yeah. near a good enough. No, it's not a good film. enough movie to no go all the way. No disrespect to Wonder Woman. My favourite film of the year was directed by a female, but we'll get to that in a second. Miriam, what's another film or television show that you'd well, like to bring uh, to the table? While we're kind of on this topic, I was thinking one of mine is Handmaid's Tale. And, yeah. um, That's mine yeah, too. Yeah. Oh, there yeah, we go. Totally right. Totally I, I was really curious yeah. as a big anyway. lover of the book pre-series. You got yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah so uh, yeah, go I also was mm. a big lover of the book, but I feel like this really allows you to take it further because obviously they have the opportunity to explore it in greater depth. Being a series, which is the best thing for me mm. about TV right now, yeah. is that you're getting to see what we used to put into a film and just see the highlights now into like a really beautiful drawn-out story. Yeah. So um, yeah, and um, famously, The Handmaid's Tale was written based based on only things that had actually happened throughout history. Mm. And so I think that's why it makes it uh, yeah. so relatable, not yeah. just, like, so everyone's making all these comments on how it's related to Trump and related to America, but we could really relate it to anything throughout time, and that's mm. what I think is so exciting yeah. about it. And I think one of the things one of the things that I liked about the Handmaid's Tale series the most is that I think in the best possible way, um, it really stands on its own feet as a piece of television. It does something quite different uh, it's a terrible sentence. It, it executes something that, that that doesn't isn't there in the in the novel. It isn't just slavishly reproducing mm. the novel and the world of the, of the novel. It tells it, it tells the story in a slightly different, much more visual, mm -hmm. cinematic way. And it, there, there's a I think there's a naturalism in the in the series that's completely absent from the book in lots Agreed. of ways. And I, I think they yeah. take really really healthy liberties mm -hmm. to do something quite different to the that um, the Atwood novel that, it, that it's based on, which is why it, it works. I hate yeah. television that is well, slavishly reproduced yeah. source having, material. Yeah. It's, <laughs> worth, it's worth having a look at the Focus Schlundorf version of the film, which I don't think... I've I mean, seen look, it. Yeah, 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 I've, I've seen, seen it, it too. It, it's, it, 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 it was, it was quite like pretty it. faithful, it's and it's right. actually a pretty good version. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the, where I think the TV series shines is, A, apart from the fact it's a TV series, and as you've already explained, is able to fit in much more and yeah. develop... Um, story and characters more. Mm. What that is with Moss does she's that is brilliant. I can normally take or leave her, but I think she's great in this. Yeah. She is able to play uh, a character who a lot of the time is passive, and we mm. register the active emotions that are going on in her head. Yeah. So she does it mm. through the most subtle but very powerful acting. Whereas if you look at Natasha Richardson, who had the equivalent role yeah. in the film, uh, Natasha Richardson really was relatively blank. Yeah, Paris. Not a terrible actor, but yeah. I mean, it wasn't a really outstanding. Which is, it which is more work like on that level. Which is more like the novel and the character in the novel. I well, think. The, no the, the novel gets dealt with in the series in the first episode. Yeah, pretty much. Like that's yeah. the the novel yeah. is episode one, yeah. and then the next seven episodes are all. Well, and they do this. They do this new. They do this thing with the Elizabeth Moss character, which I really liked. And tell me what you guys think. Where it, the, her character is very much based on a sort of modern twenty first century 
independent liberal young woman mm. and, and all of her backstory that is revealed is relatable along those lines yeah. and that's not in the novel at all. No. So it anchors the, the entire story yeah. emotionally through sort of uh, contemporary interpretations of, of kind of young, young, modern, independent women. How do you guys feel about the flashbacks? How do you feel about I'm, I'm, how they got there because in the novel you're just in the world mm -hmm. it's just this is what's happened but in the tv series they attempt to show you how it happened mm. with those flashbacks did we buy those yeah i, I didn't did I, you buy them i didn't have any problem yeah i think them. it's quite important the flashbacks mm. are important because so many people i know were like i don't want to watch some olden day film because they didn't know about the novel and so they don't realize that no it's really about the future and the potential mm. of what could happen you know it's a dystopia they thought it was old yeah that will, because of the um, old in terms of, because they're all wearing the hoods and yeah. the world that it's created yeah. is yeah. this the theocratic world, yeah. um, they just assumed that it was based in the past. Mm. And so I think that's what's interesting. Okay. And I think the way, one of the most interesting flashbacks to me is when um, at first all the, women's get all the women get fired from their work and the money yeah. gets taken out of their account. Yeah. And there's a line that her mm. husband says to her um, when she's really clearly distressed about it. And her husband says... Don't worry, I'll look after you. And for me, that was just that completely ripped my wow. heart out because it's yeah. like, no, nice. that that's not the point. It doesn't yeah. matter who you are. That yeah. means I have no no choice anymore. I can't yeah. leave you. There's nothing. Yeah. I have no choice in my life. I also so, I also think that Handmaid's Tale as a series, and when people talk about the sort of merging of the production values of cinema and television, mm. to me, The Handmaid's Tale and and Possibly the Queen actually are the two best the examples. Crown? Of, sorry, the, the mm. Crown. Thank you. Yeah, mm. um, the two best examples of that this year and just the way that those two series are photographed mm -hmm. and young edited. Pope. Young Pope as well. Yeah, the, the Sorrentino, that's, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Are they, yes, are in they, terms of production values. And, and, still, and who is another intensely visual director mm. and, and filmmaker. Cinema director. But yeah, yeah, yeah great you're saying with Han cinema director. Sorry. No, no, sorry. When you're saying with Handmaid's Tale, I think that shallow focus that they use a lot is mm. amazing in that you, and what you were saying before yeah. about how you can really read all of her emotions, mm. it's because it's an internal world, they have no um, autonomy in the outside world all they have is their mental state yeah. and we get to see that so clearly and yeah. with that cinematog you know, the way they're doing the cinematography yeah. I think really adds to that. Absolutely. Miriam what did yeah. you think about every episode finishing with this abrupt tonal shift of like after all this like 59 minutes of harrowing drama suddenly having a pop song and her being like bitches or whatever you know <laughs> what I mean? Did you find that? How did you find that? Oh I haven't thought about that but I felt, me, it, I felt it. Yeah. It felt to me tacked on. Right. It, it felt did to in me the last, weird. It was much more conspicuous in the last couple of episodes. I, I noticed that in about mm -hmm. the penultimate episode and thought there was a really unfortunate musical choice from memory. I can't remember yeah, what like was, most was, episodes mm -hmm. ended all weird. of a sudden. It felt like a video clip. The three or four women walking mm -hmm. down the street oh, yeah. looking cool. Oh no, and, I love that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was maybe uh, there was one. Um, I think I thought it gave us false hope. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, it did kind of risk throwing us out, but it didn't work that way for me. And that was, they used the Blondie song, Heart of Glass. Yeah. And they, it's, it's, um, it's a mashup with mm. a Philip Glass piece. So yep. a piece of, you know, yep. beautiful. Minimalist piano. Yeah, either piano or string quartet. And, and it was a, 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 an amazing piece of music. I'd never heard mm. that. Yeah, yeah, the one I'm thinking of. And it works it's, in the mood of the piece for me, but I can understand if it didn't work for everybody. Mm. The one I'm thinking of now is when she says, "If you didn't want us to be an army, don't put us in uniform." And <laughs> they're walking down the street, and I liked it because I felt like you're seeing all this horrific stuff where people yeah. have no no way of being able to achieve what they want to, but then you're shocked back into the real world, and it's like, what are you going to do? I feel like that dramatic shift is really great. Rather than you taking out this forlorn feeling of hopelessness, you take yeah. out this, like, what am I going to do about it? Let's have so a look at the film. So, but should we stick for TV for now? Because I think it's been yeah, a sure. really, really good year for TV. And if, if, we're, if we're talking about... Um, genuinely innovative new series this year. Mm. I may be the only, I don't know if, if anyone else has seen this yet, the Vietnam War, Ken yeah. Burns' yeah, documentary I, I this it. year. All right, I really, 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 really love that. And largely because I, this is quite a different documentary to Ken Burns' other films in a way. So I don't know if, if people know his, his, his other work. He did the, the Civil War, jazz, baseball. He does these uh, prohibition, these incredibly detailed, meticulously well-researched um, documentary films that use a lot of stills and talking heads, so they, they haven't yet, I love them all, but they haven't yet been particularly cinematic. This, to me, is, is his, his best, the best thing that he's ever done. 
Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of fatuous, obvious thing to say when people talk about combining the political with the personal. But I've never seen that done as well in a non-fiction work as, as this film. And it has an extraordinary amount of archival footage mixed with... Um, talking head footages and the way that he edits it is is just unbelievably evocative. And there's also this in really really innovative score by Trent Reznor, the ex Nine Inch Nails frontman, and, and Atticus Ross, who uh, have done all of Finch's, um, Finch's stuff. Yeah. They've done all of Finch's um, soundtracks since um, the Social Network, and I kind of changing the way that that people use. You know, and we're moving quickly away from kind of orchestral traditional scores, and it just adds these washes of sort of terrifying white noise and, and electronics and guitars to proceedings. And it just, it just creates uh, a, a mood that I've never, ever seen in a, in a, in a, in a documentary before. And it it's, was the most moving thing I watched this year. And the I thing cried about that, multiple times. And it's the thing about that documentary is... Tragic. They go to Vietnam. They get the Vietnamese yeah. side. And I've seen a million sides. documentaries about the Vietnam War, but it's always been... About the American and involvement, in and this is about the Vietnamese involvement. This is about the French involvement. This is about the actual totality of the thing. It's God, not just about the American absolutely. side. Absolutely, and God knows how they track down some of the some of the interviewees. I know, but they have they have members, senior members of the North Vietnamese Army, and yeah. and women that were involved in plugging holes in the Ho Chi Minh Trail, where sixty thousand North Vietnamese. When it died. Yeah. Just terrible, Do horrific Do we know where this can be seen in it's Australia? St it starts it on, on SBS. SBS has it. Oh, oh great. Right. Yeah. You can buy it currently. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's 10. It's huge. It's enormous. And don't watch all of it at once and, yeah. and make sure you're in a, you're in a good place. We talk about Netflix. I mean, we, 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 like we talk about Netflix watch. a lot, but I mean, this, the two of the leading series this uh, year were both on SBS yeah. uh, and, and streamed on SBS on demand. That's yep. Young Pope, which I yep. threw in uh, that yep. back there. Plus Hammond's Tale, mm. um, extraordinary. Yeah. yeah, which is a really interesting development mm. in, in the local mm. um, um, scene, I yeah. think. And, and, you know, SBS are criticised sometimes for being a little bit behind the game and, you know, showing Series 3 of Vikings, you know, yeah. six months after it's been shown everywhere else in the world. So I'm really glad to see them yeah. becoming a, um, a, a really, um, uh, you know, even yeah. field player. They're, they're streaming, yeah, yeah, and they had a problem stand. about two years ago when they launched their sort of streaming service, um, and it was technically awful. It's not great, uh, but it's got a lot better. It's got better. It's it's, it's got pretty, a lot better. It's a pretty frustrating. It, used to, it, it got to a point where yeah. um, I I just said I can't use it until they actually yeah. they should not have launched it until they were ready. But yeah. it's much more. Yeah, no, I agree. Now. What about yeah. a documentary film, Lyndon? You have a documentary. Oh, yeah. Well, I looked at my sort of top nine or ten uh, documentary films, and there's a lot of um, films about the arts, performers, performance. Um, mm. So my favourite, and this is uh, uh, to do perhaps with my musical taste to, to a degree, it's an incredibly insightful documentary, beautifully researched, and it's called Chasing Train, oh, the John Coltrane documentary. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, now any jazz fan... Uh, or certainly anybody who likes contemporary jazz is very familiar and reveres John Coltrane as one of the greats um, tenor, saxophon tenor and uh, soprano saxophonist who died uh, when he was pretty young uh, and had, uh, had played with Miles Davis as well and helped to create, you know, was one part of the, the, the major jazz um, groups, small groups of the time. The influence of a hell of a lot of other musicians, and well, and outside like, of jazz as well, I think. Yeah, in, he, he's yeah a giant in fact, in they, there are influence. I mean, they, they interviewed people like, for example, Carlos Santana and a few other rock musicians as well, who talk about the influence on uh, you know rock that was going on as well. A lot of people looked up to Coltrane. There's even a little bit incongruously um, Bill. Clinton, mm. uh, who was a fan. Of course, he's, he's a, a saxophonist. Ah. But actually, what he says is very insightful. So uh, at first, I was going, oh, why do they need to bring Bill Clinton in? But he does say some some really good things. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I and if that it. helps to get it to a bigger audience, then I think that's fine. Yeah, um, I agree. It's I a agree. beautifully made film that really gave me uh, a strong insight into what kind of person John, John Coltrane was. And there was something really warming about that because he comes across as being a really... Lovely guy, yeah. a very, oh. very with strong values. Yeah, uh, uh, he wasn't p perfect. He went through his, as did nearly all of the jazz musicians at the time. You know, had his heroin period yeah. um, and uh, managed to, you know, had the sense to see that that was taking him nowhere and it would lead to a 
lead to his death if he didn't do something about it. So yeah, I saw, I saw it as well, and I really liked it. Yeah. I I wanted a little bit more because I don't know. To me, Coltrane is a he's a you know he's a quite a religious figure in yeah. the modern music landscape, and a lot yeah. of people in experimental and underground music um, have been influenced by him. Yeah. I think over the last 30, 40 years mm -hmm. as well. I wanted a little bit more of that. I thought it was. Some of the criticisms that people laid at Ken Burns' jazz documentary was, was saying, I thought it was a little bit too focused on the, the jazz and improvised music world. And I mm. think Coltrane's legacy, and you look at like Flying Lotus, who's, who's related to him, and, and Alice Coltrane, and that lineage into contemporary electronic music wasn't there as much, out. Okay, as, as, as much as I wanted. Mm. But it is a beautifully made mm. documentary, and, mm. and I do think they capture his sort of enigmatic kind of John Coltrane humanism, you just love him I in didn't, the film. He's, did you see it? No. I okay. didn't think it was a spectacular year for feature length cinematic documentaries. Yeah, I agree And I think there's probably a reason. I think the reason is television. I think, mm. you know, because television has all this money to spend, especially, you know, places like HBO documentaries yeah. and Netflix documentaries, etc., yeah. I think we are seeing that the I, I think we've had the peak of cinematic documentaries mm. and we're on the downside of it. Mm. I remember like a few years ago, only a few years ago, like three or four years ago, when I would draw up a top ten list and most of them were feature documentaries. Mm. And this year I struggled to think of one that I think is worthy of, you know, really considered a very, very good film. So the only documentary I've got in my list is Risk, and I feel like I'm the only person yeah, okay. on the planet right. who's seen Risk. Yeah, I've seen, seen Risk. No. The, 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 the Assange Assange documentary. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, Laura it's Poitras's yeah, film yeah. about Julian Assange, essentially. Oh, yes, I have seen it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I didn't think it was that great. Yeah, well, right. and, and that's yeah. the thing. If, yeah. that, if that was the best of the year, right. even it, it, it wasn't but that... Do you think... There were a few... Uh, do you think that's, be, that's because I think a lot of the best documentary filmmaking now is longer-form stuff that's being done in television? The O.J. Simpson last year, Vietnam War this year. I kind of see. Yeah, it's a longer, lot of the or it's going stuff. straight to television because it's funded by television mm. for television. Um, but it's been true of a long time in documentary, yeah. at least two or three decades, surely. Yeah, but that I mean, really I saw an interesting documentary that I think was probably funded by Netflix or something called. Um, uh, Mummy Dead and Dearest, which was a very strange right. case of a, an autistic daughter who killed her mother in America. Okay. So Oof. there's been a lot of these sort of like clickbaity films about weirdness and yeah. oddity and crime and gruesomeness. But in terms of like documentaries that examine the human yeah. condition, I really couldn't find that many. The only other thing I mentioned very quickly, I won't talk about it long, was a docu an English documentary called Bunch of Cunts. <laughs> K U N S T. That's just perfectly to, okay. Just then. to clarify, clearly it's a play on word about the English band Sleaford Mods. Kunst means German word for yes. art. And it's a German, it's a Is German it really? yeah. documentary. Kunst. Yeah, German, German, yeah, for, yes, they're yeah, very good, Lyndon. So um, I, I love cunts. You missed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, no ab yeah, kunst, absolutely. Kunst, yeah, kunst. kunst. Yes, yeah. But clearly, you yeah. know. And, yeah. and it's about the Sleaford Mods who are this singular British. Um, I don't know if anyone knows them. They're basically um, very, very um, working class guys from um, the Midlands of England who basically get in front of a microphone with these minimal beats and stream, stream out this sort of stream of consciousness invective about um, the British underclass. And they're a very special musical experience and it's a really, really magical documentary of how, that I think kind of captures the mood in the UK at the kind of post-austerity Brexit, Europe, uh, England and the sort of general mood hmm. of the, yeah, the <laughs> rise of the far right and the disintegration of their social model in Europe really, really well. So that would be the only one that I'd mention. Oh, cool. Okay. I would definitely mm. like Bunch to check of that out. Um, right here, the go-betweens documentary was extremely... Is that really good? Yeah. Is it, is it, is it good? Real, okay. Yeah, and very right. well made. And that was available in a TV version and a feature film version. Right. I've seen the feature film version twice. Yeah. Stood up very well mm. to... Uh, uh, it, it, it happened almost by accident in the sense that Chris Stenders, the director, had wanted to make a film about the go-betweens two songwriters exclusively. You know, yeah. Robert Forster and Grant McLennan. Grant yeah. having passed away, unfortunately, very a few years ago. And um, the rights to the music were also owned by the uh, two women in the band, Lindy Morrison 
and Amanda Brown. And they said, no, you're going to make this film. You want the rights to, to the music, you're going to have to go through us. And we want ah. to be, you've got to make it, it's got to be our story as well. Mm. And that was a great decision because yeah. it... Well, Lindy Morrison has emerged as kind of the really yeah. interesting character. An incredible character. How yeah. would you make a film about the, the, the go-betweens without having her as a central, yeah, you know, yeah. one of the central characters? Yeah. And there's some very, um, you know, because there were two relationships, you know, um, lovers relationships in the band, um, that comes out very clearly in that relationship between the music and the personnel and the and the relationships is, is really what the subject of the film is. Yeah. Not so much on the music, although, I mean, you do get a pretty good insight. I've, I've heard that that is a spectacular documentary. Mm. I'm glad you mentioned it. The only Australian film that I really mm. rated this year was Hounds of Love. I didn't like it as much as the you Perth did. It was a serial killer film. Yeah, yeah I, I, I thought it was... Pretty amazing, basically because of the central performance by Emma Booth. Emma Booth plays a woman who is under the spell, under the thrall of a man, and what he gets her to do is, the two of them, kidnap and sexually torture young women. And so the film follows the course of... At the beginning of the film, they've just finished with one woman and, at the, and in the second scene, they pick up a new woman and it's the course of that woman's experience with this couple and the central relationship of the film, it's not about the man, it's about the women and it's about Emma Booth gradually realizing that what she's doing is absolutely wrong yeah. because mm -hmm. at the beginning of the film, she's under this guy's spell. And the reason I liked it is over the course of my life, you know, we've read all these horrific cases where couples have done these horrific things. And I've always thought, what the fuck is the woman doing there? You know, why is she doing this? We all know that men are capable of this, but what the fuck is going on with a woman? And that's what this film is about. Mm. It's about what the fuck was the woman doing? Yeah. Mm. And, and that makes it very, very, very compelling. But on the other hand, it is a lurid movie about well, that's, horrible that's things. That's my problem. It's really, <laughs> you know, that's really, the flip side of I it. I thought this was a really <laughs> terrible year for an Australian film. Me too. Film. I, I, we should I, talk I, about I that. Like and I like, enjoy this more than most Australian films released this year. But to me, this is a really, really well-made and really well-performed film that is just far too reliant on kind of established torture porn tropes still and well it never I'd, showed uh, anything particularly you know it, it well, wasn't it, sh it still shows quite a lot and and i just bad think, movies well yeah i just I'm, just I'm done with that i'm sort of bored with that and but, see i felt and, that yeah sorry so yeah no i yeah, yeah well, but exactly I, I, i'm the same agree. but perhaps coming in for, for coming at this from a very personal it's angle, boring now uh, perhaps i'm squeamish but i, I just find those songs just depress me and I, and I get nothing i get very little out of them yeah and, 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 I, and that's how even though it was a very interestingly made film, and I know you really liked it, The Killing of a Sacred Deer, mm, and that's me with that feeling yeah. that it was okay, it wasn't torture porn in, in the same way yeah. as, as, as other films. Yeah. But in the end, I just thought it's, it, the, any insights into the human condition were very slim, really. In well, because you're distracted of, of, by the uh, and it just, I execution. I just left out feeling really sickened by yeah. the fact that this is really about the... The killing of a child, you know, yeah. parents killing a child, and, and do people who wander into that film know what they're really in for? Mm. Really well, like, there's nothing. Ride. Look, there's nothing wrong with difficult yeah. subject matter, but to Agreed. execute it is is a really, yeah. really hard thing to pull off as yeah. a filmmaker. I think, and yeah. keeping keeping your audience there, it's you know, I, I admire the bravery of filmmakers, yeah. and I love you know films that you know involve a lot of work yeah. for the audience to do. But it's really yeah. hard to pull off, and too yeah. much of the time, like in Hounds of Love. Yeah. They just revert to these obvious graphic tropes, yeah. and you know, cinema is a visual art form, sure, fine, but sometimes illusion and less is more, and well, suggestion fun, visually yeah. is much more sophisticated film. A as Michael Haneke yeah. did with Funny Games, Absolutely. both versions. I mean, yeah. really, uh, they were not whatever you think of them, and they were pretty hard to watch in many ways. Yeah. Um, they were not exploitative. And he no, and through deliberate decisions he made. About and that's not, that he, that's not that horrific things always need to happen off screen. Yeah, I'm not sure that it's, Killing it's, of Sacred Deer is exploitative in that way either. I mean, he, he I mean, deliberately kind of... Uh, uh, sets you up in a way that kind of alienates you from the characters with these mm. ultra wide lens shots. You know the widest the widest lens in <laughs> that you've seen you know in the year in cinema. I had the um, exact same problem with Raw, which is a film that I know you really love. My film loved of the year. Well. Yeah. Wow. Film I, of the year. So again, I I 
um, was kind of bored at the halfway point by the, the some of the sort of shock for the shock's sake. And I I personally don't think that's anywhere near as transgressive a film as you do. But we can we can we can uh, healthily. Okay. Explicitly you, disagree. Yeah. Your film of the year, number one. Yeah. What were you say? Sorry, says, uh, yeah, 2017. Have I haven't, no. Ah. But I, I saw your little review on it. But um, I think 2017 is so big on horror films and horror films that relate back to different social contexts. Mm. And I think maybe this idea of putting out such graphic horror is just is really a generational difference too. I think like we're so used to seeing that kind of stuff. You have to push it to such an extreme in order to get any difference. And I think the balance between... Um, unexpectedly seeing something really graphic. You don't want yeah. to be seeing it in every scene, but yeah. seeing it unexpectedly and then knowing that it's behind closed doors, that's what's shocking, the challenge between the two. Mm. And, um, yeah, that's what I'm interested yeah. in. Yeah. I think it was the year of intelligent horror. There's no doubt. There's films like Raw, The Killing of a Sacred Deer, Personal Shopper, which is actually a ghost story, yeah. mm. Get Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, out. get Out is... There were, uh, get out many is. of the best films of this year were horror adjacent. Yeah. Yeah. They were playing with a horror format, but they had something more to say. Yeah. It's like the portrayal of the ghosts in Personal Shopper was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. The best. yeah, I agree. I mean, the film had some Certainly. flaws. I thought yeah. the side of the film that was a thriller or maybe a thriller in inverted Which is commas, sort of didn't different, work it's at if, all. It's from a different film, that yeah. portion of that yeah, film. Yeah, it didn't that work really, at all. That kind of ruined that but film. The ghost I thought it was two-thirds of a good but film. But certainly, yeah. I mean, I Sorry. know those two Did you see Personal yeah, Shopper? Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I was just really caught up with it the whole time. And Kristen yeah. Me too. It's Kristen amazing. She was yeah. yeah. She was astonishing. So good now. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah I, I do love I love what you're talking about in the sort of the depiction of the ghost because for the longest time with that film, you are assuming that it's not a ghost story yeah. because you're kind of thinking like, yeah. we're all adults here. You know, she's, yeah. I'm watching an adult film. She's, yeah, yeah. she's in France and she's dealing with this stuff. It's not a ghost story. It can't be a ghost story. Yeah. And then at like two thirds of the way through the film or even like yeah. seven eighths of the way through the film, he shows you a door literally opening and closing. He yeah. literally shows yeah. you, actually you're watching a ghost story. I weirdly story. saw that the same weekend <laughs> as a ghost story. Um, oh, that was is, another great film. I didn't like it at all. But, no, that, but, okay. <laughs> okay. but that's just me. I, I was, and I, I was, yeah, I, yeah. not that I This is the one where Casey Affleck turned up to set and wore a sheet, right? For most yeah, for, of the show. Right? Yeah. Did you see it? <laughs> yeah. Did no, you see I didn't see it? Say no. that. Linda and I, you, no. you liked well, it. I didn't want to, I didn't, I thought, okay, I've read about what this is about. I've seen the stills of somebody with a sheet. That looks so lame. And then the film that I saw was not at all. I thought it was so lame. I thought it was so unlame. Interesting. It was a really interesting. It wasn't a ghost. It wasn't a horror movie. Certainly. No, it wasn't. It was about, it's certainly it not that. Tri- it's about grief. Yeah. 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 It's about yeah. But uh, look, uh, yeah. To, to me, I love the setup and the idea. I just thought they didn't have a clue how to execute it in an interesting way. And then t- to me, it's this. It's ruined by this incredibly obvious, fatuous, clunky scene dropped in the middle of it, where Bonnie Prince Billy Will Oldham is basically clunkily explaining as at a student mm. party what the film and the structure and the the, the sort of metaphoric content of the film is about, and it just kind of killed me as a viewer. Um, but I, I realise that there are there are it's a it's a loved film. It's an original. It's, film, it, look, certainly. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a really it's, it's a really bold. elegant idea. Yeah. I just don't much care. And, for and the time execution. there's a there's an a, it becomes a kind of a meditation on time as well mm-hmm. and time tra- travel, which I thought was just brilliant because it is a relatively thin story and it has to find somewhere to go and it does. Mm. Bit, too, bit too thin for me. Mm. But Linda, Linda and I can well, disagree. That's, well, <laughs> that's what we're here for. Let's, Absolutely. Yeah. Let's, let's Nothing come, more boring than a room full of people who agree with each let's other. Let's come for our favourite films of the year. Look, okay. Jim, what was your favourite cinematic release movie of 2007? Can I pick two? <laughs> <laughs> sure, of course. Okay, all right. So I think if I had to pick two, and I thought about this really hard last night, there were about ten that I really, really loved. If I had to pick two... They would be um, Certain Women, Kelly Reichardt, yep. and The Death of Louis the Fourteenth uh, by wow. Albert Serra. I haven't seen that. that. Um, you, sh- you, sh- you all should, by the Catalan um, director, um, Albert Serra. I don't know if you've heard anything about it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's basically Jean the king Pierre, on his deathbed, right? Jean-Pierre Leu, who's, you know, very, very famous... Um, fr- French, you know, kind of the face of French New Wave cinema. It's like the last shot of 400 Blows. Um, so at the other end of his career, playing, you know, kind of arguably France's most loved um, monarch, 
goes for a walk, his leg's a bit sore, and all the film consists of after that is an hour and a half of effectively all set in his bed chambers as his leg inc increasingly becomes infected and it's a blood clot, and you know he's going to die. You know, you know, you Google it for 10 seconds <laughs> beforehand. and um, um, But nothing that I saw anywhere else riveted me as much as mm. that film. There's nothing more dramatic than, you know, arguably than the inevitable march that we all have towards death and it sort of condenses that over this sort of five day period into an hour and a half film as the courtiers and his inner circle run around and misdiagnose it and, and the king and his inner circle and us as the audience become increasingly aware as he does of his of his death and it's 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 so thought-provoking it's so it's so stunningly um executed um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's the, the, the writing is so good. It's such a beautiful, powerful, simple look at life and death. Nothing else that I saw touched that as a cinematic experience. For awesome. Me. Well, we've got that to look forward to. I assume it'll get a cinema release in Australia. I sincerely doubt it, unfortunately. I think oh, it, it really? was released in Europe in about a April or May. Oh. Um, and, and yep, so oh. I, I, a colleague recommended it to me and I watched it in about June. and. I didn't see anything better. The death of Louis XIV. Mm -hmm. Being in Australia, we might see it, you know, in three years' time. On SBS, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Miriam, what That's was me. your favourite film that you I saw have, in the cinema this year? Yeah, mine is contentious. I know Jim already does not like this film, but mine was Mother was my favourite oh, film. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, I'm like, glad someone like brought Mother to the table. Yeah. I like the way you incorporated the exclamation mark into yeah. your delivery of the title. Very Mother. Great. Otherwise, people wouldn't know what I was talking <laughs> about. But yeah, obviously, Darren Aronofsky, I, no, I don't need to explain it, but I think for me, what I really took from that is when I left the cinema, I was completely shaken. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was because of the like grotesque, uh, over-the-top kind of horror that they used. I don't know if it was because of like the creepy way that it was shot. I don't know if it was because I had no idea what was going on. But uh, for me, I just walked out and I was just so viscerally alive and I just thought I had so many thoughts and so many ideas about what it might be about and you know some people use that as a criticism because it's like what the hell is it about it's just a mess of everything th thrown in together which I don't disagree with yeah. but at the same time I walked out feeling like there's, there's a line in it where um, essentially the book that the poet has written um, people say that it they think it's speaking directly to them individually everyone yeah. thinks it's their own story and that's what got me I came out of it and I saw my life flashed in front of me and like <laughs> and, and I think That's so many great. people I've spoken to have exactly the same experience but with completely different storylines. Have that you they seen this? Up. CJ and I talked about it a, oh. a while ago. You didn't see Mother? Okay. Yeah. I like it a little bit <laughs> more mm. um, since I saw I still think I still personally think it's a pretentious indulgent mess. Sure. But it's such a in some ways brave, ambitious mm. film. I sort of like that it exists and it's that he made it without actually admiring it. That's a strange yeah. position. I like know, really yeah, but I can yes. see where you're coming from. Like yeah. for me, it is it is basically as pretentious as filmmaking gets. It's extremely but it delights in its pretension. Yeah. You know, that's what that's what it is. It is pretentious. You know, it's basically he's taken he's done the Bible story, but with mm. like youth, you know, these young attractive actors in a house. Yeah. And yeah. it is it is utterly Enthralling. It's not boring. It's no, not boring. It's, 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 like not a visual, it's like a visual artist just got like a canvas and threw paint at it and threw yeah. hamburgers at it and threw blood at it. Like I you can then work out whatever you want. I from guess that. that was my main problem with it. Yeah. It seems undisciplined and uncontrolled to mm. me. And I think good filmmaking is all about reining it in and showing, Ooh. deciding what to show and what not to show. But that, but that was yeah. I, yeah. We can we can respectfully, violently disagree. Sure. And, and I yeah, I do. I, I do like it a little more, yeah. but it just it's not for me. I like it. I like it for all the reasons that you don't like it. Mm -hmm. I think I like its messiness. I like its pretension. I like that it is just a guy having a very expensive wank, you know, and putting it on I would screen. Agree with that, you know, this is it's a very personal film. He's got final cut. He went, he wrote it in five days. Yeah. He put what he wanted to put on screen, and it's kind of like. Take it or leave it, yeah. you know? Yeah. You can take it or you, I don't care. You can, and it, it actually really had quite a cultural moment for a second there until nobody went to see it. Yeah. Like, I'm so glad that, yeah. you know, three of us have seen it because yeah. nobody saw that movie. Yeah. It tanked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But briefly, people were talking about it, yeah. you know, in certain circles. Everyone I know has just had a, such a strong reaction to it, and that's what I Which love. Which is a good sign, you yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, if you get, and, you know, I'm sort of, and that's what I meant. I, I'm yeah. sort of fine with that. If you're going to make a film, do something 
you know, push yourself and yeah. sometimes you're going to fall on, you, fall on your ass mm. and I think he does, but yeah. at least you're trying to do something new and I'm, I'm fine with that. And I do like, Aronofsky is such a nutty, nutty mm -hmm. filmmaker. I'm sort of still, I, you sort of look at his body of work and I'm so fine with it. Mm. The, strangest, the, I don't the strangest yeah. thing about that like film this. was the meta textual <laughs> element that within the film, I mean, it's essentially the Bible story, but within the film, it's also the story of a young woman with a significantly older male partner. He's like in his early 50s, she's in her mid 20s, and he is an artist and he's a poet, he's pretentious. Mm -hmm. And part of the film is kind of his self justification that being an artist eclipses everything else. Mm -hmm. And you can watch it fine that way, but when you watch it knowing that during its making, Jennifer Lawrence and Darren Aronofsky became a couple, mm. it becomes creepy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's exciting too because that's the, the idea of great art, in my opinion, is to put the worst of you on the line and to just go for it. And, you know, the way that he could be viewed from that is yeah. terrible. So yeah. but the way I saw the film was very much like every individual had something that they loved so much and they would do anything, whether it's like completely allowing someone to eat your baby or whether it's like ripping out your own heart for the person that you love. Like no matter what, like love will destroy you. And I just thought that that was really beautiful. <laughs> I was, I, was yeah. I broke out in tears at the end oh, of the wow. Yeah. 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 Lyndon, what was your favorite film? Of well, the well, I already mentioned it, Tony Urban, really. Tony I mean, Urban, number yeah. one. Yeah. All right, CJ, what was it, Raw? My, my favourite film was Raw. Basically, wow. it, it's a film about a, a young woman who goes to veterinary college mm -hmm. in Belgium, and while she's there, she's a vegetarian, and while she's there, she is forced to eat a rabbit liver <laughs> because that's part of the hazing ritual, and in doing so, it brings out her latent cannibalism. So on the surface, it is a film about a woman who has a problem with cannibalism. But... <laughs> That is only, you know, the surface level. That's the entry point to the film. It is just an incredible piece of visual, sonic, filmmaking. It is, it is a director, a female director, Julia Durkinau, um, making her first film. And to me, that's always the most exciting films of mm -hmm. the year, is yep. when someone debuts strongly. Mm -hmm. yep. And to me, this film is this... It, it's a director and she's, you know, she's probably in her mid-30s, so she's she's no youngie, but she's not old either. She's got a lot more time and it's her announcing herself. She's like, here's a film, bam. I think it looks and sounds great. I think it's full of really obvious clunky symbolism, but that's but that's just me. Yeah, well, it goes great all the right. way. Like, Jim, I mean, Jim Williams, it, The metaphor it. is pretty, you know, it's pretty basic, you know. Yeah. She's a cannibal, you know. <laughs> Insert, you know, your it's own addiction It's a technical here. marvel, though, for a first film, I agree. Yeah. And I, I love the so. Jim Williams music. It does all of Ben Wheatley's... Um, oh, films. the music's phenomenal. Did you see Raw? No. No, you didn't. You know, yeah. you, you, you're going to? <laughs> no, probably not. It's, <laughs> it is, it's not for the, it's not for the squeamish. Well, yeah, as I've, I've said, you know, I actually take a personal decision because yeah. I don't have to, I mean, I've been through periods when I've, you know, like working for the mainstream media, you used to see everything yeah. and it's just part of your job, but if, yeah. now I don't have to. And the, the outlet that I write for mm. uh, most of the time, which is Limelight magazine, yeah. um, you know, the, it's, it's an older, more arty, can, sort of uh, audience and they're not, they're not going to want me to write about those kind of films anyway so I don't need to write about them and to be honest um, I don't like putting myself through um, what I find to be unpleasant experiences. Ah uh, yeah. Mm. Well yeah, if you ever yeah. see it you'll discover so very, it's not unpleasant. Yeah mm. so oh, you won't find me going to see um, mm. Get you know, a Serbian film, or, yeah. or the things Hostel that are, Nine, Hostel oh, Nine, God. or even Hostel One. You know, um, I found pretty hard to yeah. get through. But yeah. I would say 2017 is just a good year for experimentalization. Experimentalization is not a word. Experimenting, experimental filmmaking. Experimental I agree. filmmaking, diversity. Yep. Like that's what I found really yep. exciting about all of the choices that we had. On that highly artistic note, you've been watching <laughs> Watch This. Thank you very much, Lyndon Barber, Miriam Kappa, and Jim Flanagan. We'll see you in 2018. Take care.